I'm back with episode three of the James Cook podcast. And uh, what I've been doing is interviewing my favorite interviewers. I've met uh, some of these guys throughout my life, some of these guys on the road. I am very, very glad to uh, have Mr. Jim Nash on my show today. Jim, how you doing, buddy? I'm great, brother. How you doing? I'm doing good. Surviving? (laughs) Doing what I can, man. Hey, are we all? Trying to get my wife the space she needs right now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cooped up in a mine house. Won't, mine won't hardly let me out of her uh, out of her sight. Or my fiance, we got uh, we got engaged several months ago, and and uh, you know we made it through this pandemic and being locked down and quarantined and all that stuff for two solid months. Yeah. And I was like, well, I told I told my boss, I was like, man, I think this one's gonna stick. He goes, how's that? And I go, well, we're cooped up for two months, and I didn't kill her, and I didn't take the ring back, so we're good to go. I think. <laughs> That's how you know. I mean, usually I say, if you really want to know if it works, go on a trip together. Yeah, uh, because yeah. You're, stu- you're stuck in a foreign town. You got to kind of think, yeah. you know, together. You got to work together. Uh, this is also, this will also work. I don't recommend this, but uh, <laughs> this will also work. Well, congratulations, man. Uh, Thanks, brother. On, uh, on, on, on being engaged. Uh, yeah. I am excited to dig in uh, to your life. I, I know it. I feel very connected with you all the time because... The station that I worked for was basically started because of you. There is no <laughs> ifs, ands, or buts about it. For a man to start a station and never work that station, that's quite an accomplishment. Isn't it? Yeah, that's me. That's my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I never oh. wanted to leave anything in, unfinished. Yeah. Well, except that one time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I did want to start off with some origins. Where'd you grow no, up? Um, originally, well, I grew up um, in Lexington, Oklahoma, which is oh, Mormon. And um, it's a little, um, I think our graduating class was like 42 people. Yeah. So um, it was a small town. I lived out in the country and did the, you know, the farm stuff yeah. every day before school and after school and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was, I mean, the thing is, is like I didn't move to the country until I was like, probably 10 years old or so. Yeah. So growing up in the city, in Oklahoma City, and then moving to the country is like culture shock. Yeah. You know, my dad, my dad grew up in the country and he was like, I'll teach you how to be a cowboy. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so we <he> did. <laughs> so did you, did you start DJing out there in Oklahoma or? Yeah. Um, I, I had played in a band for many, many years and, um, and, my first wife uh, was, I mean, I was gone all the time playing music and stuff. As you know, that's takes a toll on the family, you know? And yeah. she, um, she said, uh, you know, Hey, it's either us or the music. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So I wanted to stick with something that was music oriented. And I'd always wanted to work in radio. And I used to pretend when I was a kid, you know, I'd put the headphones on and we had a pool table and I'd, I'd jam the end of a cue stick into the one of the pockets, you know, and pretend that was my microphone, and we'd play records and all this. I mean, they did the radio thing, you know? And um, so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll try radio. I checked into broadcasting school up in Oklahoma City, and I started going to that at night. I just happened to meet a guy named Charlie Jones at um, KBLP Radio in uh, Lindsay, Oklahoma. And he goes, man, why don't you come down to the station? I'll kind of show you around, show you everything, how everything works and things like that. And I'm like, awesome, man, I'll do that. So I started hanging out down there. Well, then I started missing school because I was hanging out at the radio station all the time. And I'm one of the kind of people that can learn more hands-on than, it, than I can sit in a classroom. I can't do it in a classroom. Yeah. So um, I got lucky and you know, I, had, I thought, man, I can learn more at this radio station by doing it than I can sitting up there and learning all these rules and all this kind of stuff. So I quit school and um, started just kind of interning down there. And that lasted about a week and a half and it was getting close about two weeks before Christmas. And he calls me out of the blue one night about seven o'clock and he goes, Hey man, a seven to midnight guy walked out on me. You want to jump on the air and take a seven to midnight shift? And I'm like, I'd never done a shift in my life. I go, yeah, I'll do it. So I did. Thank you, team Macon. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's exactly what we did, too. We played records and CDs and uh, what's called carts, which are, are like, they look like eight tracks in case people out there don't know what they look. They look like an eight track tape. They have yeah. songs on them or commercials and things like that. So we were combining all of that stuff together to make a radio show. And uh, 
So it's kind of cool, you know. So yeah. I, that's how I got started in it. Man, that's always, I always think that's the most fascinating thing. When I joined radio, it had just turned over to a digital age where you didn't right. have to do records. You didn't have to do cassettes, any of that stuff. So when people tell me those stories, I'm like, how did you go to the bathroom? Like, how, how, do, how do you do <laughs> things, man? i tell so, you how we did it. Because back in those days, Brooks and Dunn had the, uh, the eight and a half minute dance mix of Boots, Scoot, and Boogie, man. And that was the bathroom song. <laughs> <laughs> every, every DJ has that. They can tell you off the yes. top of their head, I know exactly what song to go to the bathroom to. <laughs> eight minutes and 34 seconds, man. <laughs> that is actually, that's very good considering you're in country because classic rock DJs, they got it easy with Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Country, with country, yeah. you got to think it out, man. You got to get a, you got to get a three point Dude. Steve from holes kind of song. Right, yeah. Get that accomplished. You get the, or you get the, uh, you know, the extended version of uh, the Robert Earl Keen and uh, Road Goes On Forever and The Party Never Ends. You know, that thing's eight and a half minutes long, too. You know, so you can put both of those together, man, you got 15 minutes. <laughs> you can run to the store, get a pack of smokes, or whatever you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> live some life, live some quick life. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Honestly, my, my hat's off to every DJ who had, who actually spun records and, and all that, man, because it's, uh, it's, it's, I'm sure it got like, whoo, this is crazy easy whenever it went to uh, computers. Oh, yeah. yeah. A, it, a, lot of the, a lot of people that, you know, that got started in radio or in records with just records back in those days and reel to reel with the commercials and stuff, you know, I mean, that was, you didn't leave that room, you know, you did not leave that room for four or five hours. And, and that's uh, because if the record sticks or the record skips or something like that, you got dead air, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's got to burn also. Uh, yeah. So you said you started, well, did you start in Oklahoma City or what, what, what town was that in? Well, I, um, in Lindsay, Oklahoma is where that was at. And that was, uh, that's even, that's kind of southwest of the Lexington Purcell area where I was kind of based out of. And um, one night, uh, Charlie Jones sent me over to a place called the Silver Spur over in Marlowe, Oklahoma. And he goes, hey, I want you to go here. I want you to intro Aaron Watson or, uh, Aaron Tippin on stage oh, cool. and uh, record a, about a 20 minute interview with him on this tape recorder, bring it back and we'll play it on our Monday morning public affairs show. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, what kind of questions do I ask? He was like, I don't know. He goes, just kind of try to find out a little bit about his life and things like that. I'm like, okay, I can do that. So here I go, man, Saturday night, I head off over to Marlowe, Oklahoma, man. And uh, it was so crazy because I had never met, I mean, I'd, I'd met a few stars before, but not like that, not in that setting, you know, it was a different kind of thing, you know? And uh, so we go up under his tour bus and he was so gracious, such a nice guy. I told him what we're gonna do and I just hit play or record on the little recorder and we just sit there and recorded and talked about his songs and, and uh, you know, and him being from South Carolina, his tat he's got a tattoo on his arm with the, uh, the crescent moon and uh the palmetto tree on his okay. arm and that was that was kind of his logo um and it came out on his early records and stuff like that and i kind of asked him about that i was like where does that come from you know where did that like how that logo come about and he pulled up his sleeve and showed me his arm and he was like he goes i'm from south carolina he goes this is our state seal i go, i never knew that <laughs> so now every time i see something from south carolina dude you see the palmetto tree and the and the crescent moon that's awesome. So, that's how you learn about yeah. it. That's how, that's how you learn. And literally, learning by fire is exactly how I learned to do it. You know, and yeah. that's um, over the years as I've trained people, I kind of trained them that way. I'm like, do this, 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 and go. You know, yeah. I mean, some people catch it and some people don't. It's a scary world, but uh, the the one you it's hard to describe to other people how to really capture it because you have to kind of capture it in your own way. Right. And, and to be able to describe that, say you go and you got to kind of get it on your own because mm -hmm. I can't, I can't do you. You got to do you. Yeah. And in the media, you know, I mean, everybody, everybody that interviews people, everybody's got a different interviewing style, you know, and yeah. that's kind of new people that are getting into the media, radio or TV, even for that matter, you know, they're kind of taught that you have to learn your own style of how you interview people. My style is, is, Hey, I'm going to go over here and sit down and have a cold beer with you and let's just shoot the breeze for a little while. Um, I do want to say how, I don't remember how we met, but I think this is how we met. We'd heard of each other, but I was walking around early morning at Larry Joe Taylor 
and you were doing your morning show. You were doing it live from Larry Joe Taylor Festival. Yeah. And you and I said I like waved at you or something like that because I knew who you were, and you were like, "Hey!" And you, I don't I don't even think we really knew each other, but we kind of. No, I think like, that's oh, the first time we met. Yeah, we were like, well, we're both DJs, and we're both right. up for some reason this early in the morning. So like, hey. <laughs> and right when I got next to you and sat down, a bird crapped on your computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do remember that. <laughs> it was so funny because you were talking to somebody at the booth, like back at home, and you were like, yeah. oh, you're never going to believe this, but a bird just yeah. crapped all over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I think later on, you're just like, ah, oh, man, here I am sitting here with a hangover. I got about three hours of sleep and a bird crafts on my computer, man. It's like, well, the world can go nowhere but up from here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the day just started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back a little bit more. What brought you to Wichita Falls? Well, um, I worked for um, – I got moved to Oklahoma City. I, oh, at the Aaron Tippin show that night, I met a guy named Bill Reed that used to work at uh, KSCS. And he was moving to Oklahoma City to be the program director up there. And I ran into him that night. He and I got to chit chat and talk and stuff. He was like, hey, man, he goes, here's my info, man. If you, uh, if you ever want an overnight gig or something like that in Oklahoma City, man, give me a holler. And I'm like, cool, I will. So about six months later, I called him up. I'm like, hey, man. You got any weekend stuff or anything like that? And he goes, absolutely, I do. So I started overnights in Oklahoma City. Wow. And I worked my way up literally from overnights to um, a midday slot to becoming music director, getting on afternoon drive, doing mornings, still music director through all of this. And then um, Clear Channel, or we call them Cheap Channel then, uh, <laughs> Cheap Channel Communications come in and bought us out. And, uh, so I got fired. one by one. I lasted with them for 13 months, man. And they, they finally walked in one day and I'd taken all my stuff off the walls and everything. And I was working out of a cardboard paper box and, uh, oh. literally, and I would every day I'd take that stuff out, put it on my desk. Well, that day they came walking in and I saw the guy had an envelope in his hand. He was with the new music director. And I was like, ah, start putting stuff in the box. He goes, Jim, today's your last day. And I was, I stood up with my box and I said, thank you, sir. And shook his hand, took a second <laughs> left. <laughs> oh. So I said, I literally sat on my butt for a couple of months and uh, my RCA rep out of Nashville calls me one day and she says, hey, there's a uh, afternoon uh, music director gig open in Wichita Falls. Mm. Like, Kale, you are. And I'm like, where the hell is Wichita Falls? I didn't know where it was. <laughs> She goes, it's just across the border. So I looked at the map. I'm like, oh, that's just a couple hours away. No, no big deal. So uh, I went down and interviewed for the thing. And uh, I was going to start two weeks later. But in the meantime of me interviewing with Big Jim and, and everybody at that place, or at that time, uh, Sam Beard, uh, they hired another guy out of Lawton, Frank Series. They hired him down from K-Law to, be, to do afternoons and be music director. Because that's what he did in, in Lawton. Okay. So I was like, okay, well, uh, what am I going to do? And they go, well, how about seven to midnight? And I go, seven to midnight it is. And then uh, then Frank left. And then they moved me in the afternoons there on KLUR. And it kind of started from there. Now, the you were working KLUR. And then there was a Friday night that no one was doing anything. <laughs> you decided... <laughs> Let's do something. Now, I want to I want to back it up just a little bit before we go into that Honky Tonk Friday Nights. Right. Uh, because that was the origins of the station I work for now, 94.9 The Outlaw. But whenever you were working Oklahoma City, had you yeah. already met some of these artists that you later help, you know, become famous from Honky Tonk um, Friday Nights in, in, in the Wichita Falls scene? N not really. I mean, I was kind of familiar with... Uh, with the whole Stillwater music scene and you know the stuff that was going on up there, and um, you know I was I was pretty good friends with Garth Brooks and his and his mom whenever she was alive, Colleen, um, and he was you know he went to school in Stillwater, so he kind of helped me get familiar with a lot of the things that were going on there. But I had um, I'd become friends with the guys in the Great Divide when I was in Oklahoma City, and they were just basically starting out. And uh, we used to go see them play all the time. And um, me and my family just became real good friends with them. And um, so I thought, I told them, I was like, hey, I'm going to Wichita Falls, Texas, man. I'm taking you guys to Texas with me. They were like, oh, cool. They, they didn't think 
you can talk to those guys. None of them ever think that I was going actually. So, uh, I did, I started and I got, got in so much trouble, man. When I was doing seven to midnight, I would play, uh, pour me a vacation. Oh yeah, oh, man. Big Jim would get me on the phone. He was like, you can't be playing that. What are you playing? <laughs> It's like one of Jim's favorite songs now. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But I kept on it and kept on. I kept doing it anyway. You know, they were like, this guy's a rebel, man. I don't know what we're going to do with him. But I kept playing it. And then finally, um, the Dallas Cowboys training camp was coming to town. You know, yeah. they wanted to do a big concert. I'm like, I got the perfect band, man. Bring in the Great Divide to do it. And they were like, who's the Great Divide? And I'm like, listen to these guys. So we listened to them and then boom, got them going. That's awesome. So, and yeah, there was an explosion around that time too. So that was, was that right. late nineties or is that early two thousands? Um, that was late nineties. Yeah. So that was, late uh, ninety, late nineties had the the explosion of Great Divide. Guys like Jason Bolin, Stony Larue started making his way mm -hmm. around the Wichita Falls area across Canadian ragweed. All those guys were coming in, and what I remember the most because that scene was happening around the late nineties, early two thousands, really exploding. Yeah. And you were there. But it was all, it was the Graham Central Station vibe that really pushed that whole thing. That yeah. It was a club where every walk of life in Wichita Falls could come to. There was, there was like, yeah. you know, because they five had five clubs. different clubs, five clubs, yeah. all walks of life. Um, yeah. I remember seeing people together that I never thought I would see together. Exactly. Okay? <laughs> and they were all together hanging out, having a great time. And I remember I used to go to rock concerts, but not at Graham's. I mean, there would be, I mean, the Bowling for Soup was becoming famous right. around the late yeah. 90s as well. So they yeah. were out there as well. But then I would go, and then on some nights, I'd see, you know, Cross Canadian Ragweed play yeah. at Graham's. So it was like all these bands. And I remember going, like, dude, this stuff is awesome. Like, this, this, <laughs> yeah. to me, it was rock and roll. Like, to me, I, I they, oh, yeah, they're a rock band, man. That was a rock band to me. I, I, always, I always thought of them as just like, and it would be funny because, like, I would see my rockers and my country dudes. Yeah. They're both at the same bar, you know? And I, I just, I think I was just getting into bars around then. And, well, you um, know, it was, it was funny when, when those guys really, because the Great Divider was really the first Oki band that we, that we dealt with and played down here in Texas. And then, you know, like you said, all of those guys started kind of making some noise. And, make, and I was like, well, I'm going to book these guys down here. So I just started bringing all my Oki buddies down here. And having them play in Wichita Falls, you know, that was like yeah. their first stop ever in Texas. You know, Stoney, Brandon Jenkins, Bolin, all of those cats. Wichita Falls was their first Texas gig, you know. And yeah, I think that's one was, thing that Wichita Falls has that you really utilized, and I I found myself utilizing it. And it was having talks with you, realizing your strength was in. Hey, man, y'all want to come to Texas? And they would come to yeah. Wichita Falls because it's, it's a hot yeah. spot away. It's right there. So when you're mm -hmm. in Wichita, you really get a firsthand look on all that scene. So. Yeah, and and the cool thing about it is, it's like it's literally right across the border from Oklahoma. So we're like, think we can be their first stop right there in Wichita Falls, and that's kind of what I banked on mm -hmm. when we started booking them. You know, and we started booking them at outskirts, and we started booking them at Graham's, and and uh, you know those guys were all just, I mean, gosh, you know we. We'd bring those cats in, man, for three hundred bucks for a full band gig. That's nuts. On a dude. on a on a Friday or Saturday night, man, three hundred bucks for bowling to play. Now it's like, yeah. you can't touch that. <laughs> can't get them on the phone for three hundred dollars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One of the things I notice about you is that you have met some pretty famous people. I mean, just now, uh, in a casual way, you you just threw in, yeah, no Garth Brooks. And his mom. Yeah. And, and then you move <laughs> on as if you didn't say, hey, I knew like the biggest country star of the 90s. Right. Okay, Hit that okay. train to coming. Just pause. <laughs> this sucker's loud. I live on the tracks. Literally. Nice. Hobo Jim. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Just threw in Garth Brooks like it wasn't nothing. You you love supporting some of those guys, but you actually know them. The Bellamy Brothers, uh, Garth Brooks, Aaron Tippin was your first interview, man. I yeah. mean, that's, um, that's pretty incredible. So who are some of the more famous people that you were so excited about meeting when you finally got to, to, to talk um, with them, hang out with them? You know, it was uh, – over the years, it was really cool, you know, because uh, Blake Shelton, when he was very first starting out, you know, he came and played Wichita Falls several times. and. Um, got it's to the, interview him and the oh yeah yeah, yeah. oh he had it going on man <laughs> I, I had it going on until last week too but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is... uh, you know guys like um, Toby Keith I mean Toby Keith was in his uh, Easy Money band were playing in Oklahoma City when I was before he ever signed a record deals you know in fact his 
his bass player, Chuck Goff, that passed away a few years ago. Okay. He actually stole Chuck Goff from our band. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, we'd go so you knew see, that guy. <laughs> yeah, we'd go over and see Toby Keith and his band play on uh, on Monday nights over at Chastain's because we weren't playing. Mm. And then, uh, you know, on like one of their nights off on Sunday night or something like that, they'd come over and see us play and hang out, you know. So um, it, it's, it's weird just being in the being in the radio business, man. It just – I've never – I, I don't, I've only had like two people ever try to big boy me, you know, or something like that, you know, never. I mean, I just, they don't because they appreciate people in radio. So it, to me, it just makes it so much easier to become friends with these guys and talk to them on a personal level and get to know about them, you know, cause I mean, I was like, okay, well, uh, tell me about your new single. They don't, people don't want to hear about that. They want to know the person, you know, and nah. that makes, to me, that's that's what I enjoy is bringing that that personal touch to the to the listeners. You know, uh, Reba. Gosh, I've known I knew Reba for years and years and years. I knew her brother Peyton McIntyre real well. Wow. Um, of course, she lives. You know, she uh, lived over in Stringtown, Oklahoma, which wasn't very far from where I live. So there was a there was a, literally a span there for about five or six years. I could not tell you what was on the Nashville country music chart. Hmm. Didn't recognize, knew none of the names, nothing. Yeah. Didn't add because I was so into the Texas Red Dirt thing. And, and I, and, you know, back, that was about that time was when the Tracy Lawrence's and the Joe Diffie's and that, that whole 90s thing kind of started kind of winding down for them. And, uh, but now, man, I'm so glad to see those guys putting cool music out again, man. Yeah. Maybe, maybe country left us a little bit where, where we saw a little bit more songwriting a little bit more natural feel in the Texas red dirt scene. I know mm -hmm. that's what attracted me. I'll tell you what it was that just laid it out right. First thing. Cause I joined in 2010. That's when I joined the outlaw and the first by coincidence, by luck, the first song I remember going, dude, what is this was every girl by turnpike troubadours. Yeah. That's what made me go. All right. I'm going to listen to this forever. And that, <laughs> by coincidence that weekend, they opened for Jason Bolin at outskirts. Okay. Yeah. So it was like the great, I, I remember going to that show going like, dude, if this is what red dirt is, I'm in forever. Like it's, yeah. it was so good. I'd seen those other bands before, but it, it hadn't really taken hold. Like by the time I got in, in 2010, it was just such a big scene. Um, mm -hmm. So what were some of the bands that blew you away the first time you saw them. I, I, you, you'd mentioned um, Great Divide, so that's a right. that's an incredible and band. Yeah, I could, I could just about do you their their set list in my head every week, you know. But um, man, I tell you what, um, the first time I saw Pat Green play, I was blown away. And this was like in two thousand or two thousand one, and I was just like, "Whoa, man!" He put on a show. Yeah. And the cool thing is, is because by that time, Pat Green, Corey Morrow, Robert O'Keen, um, those guys like that, they had that they had that college market wrapped up. Man, they were huge in college towns. I mean, huge. So they those guys and Fowler, they quickly learned how to put on a show for those kids, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Pat Green was just I mean, I just thought he was freaking awesome, man. Um and um Charlie Robinson was another one that I just was really, really into his music, into his songs. And he, I loved him so much because he just played so nonchalantly. He just yeah. played it so nonchalant. Like it was just no effort in the world to do what he was doing and just mesmerizing a crowd, you know? And uh, he always has a beach both, vibe for some reason to me. He always yeah, has like, he he always looks like, like, he's in a beach. I know he wear those baggy pants and those slip on shoes or flip flops or something to show, man, and a real loose white button up shirt, you know. And looks like he should be like, sailing. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I love his but, vibe. I think that's why I like him the most, is because he's oh, like, yeah, me. you either like me or you don't. You yeah, know? and it's about that time, you know, that um, I really started getting in him, and um, I think really when I left Wichita Falls was when I really started getting into the more of the songwriter guys more than, you know, show guys. Yeah. Um, and I still love my guys, but man, I was just getting into the Bruce Robinson and, oh, yeah. um, and you know, those guys like that and Stephen from Holtz and all those cats, the older guys and Rusty Weir and Gary P. Nunn, you know, and 
I just loved listening to the songwriters and listening to the stories behind the songs and listening to the song themselves because they tell a story too, you know? So um, those guys like that, that were just legends to me that I grew up listening to. Um, that's yeah. When the first time I saw Gary P. Nunn in concert or I saw Jerry Jeff Walker and I grew up listening to Jerry Jeff Walker and Rusty Weir, you know, and, and when I finally got to meet those guys and see them play it, I'm just like, man, my dad would love this. That's what I always thought, man. <laughs> I always thought, man, my dad would eat this up. First one's coming to your mind. Favorite venue to watch a band? It's got to be in Fort Worth, Texas, just in the stockyards in general. Any yeah. of the venues in the stockyards, I'm in. Favorite festival that you just love going to? Um, it's not around anymore. But Tommy Alverson's Family Gathering was my ideal. I loved it. Yeah, it was. Um, I started going years ago when it was in Glen Rose. And, um, man, I loved it. The first time I went, it was like everybody just welcomed me with open arms, you know, and that whole everybody here's a family. If you need anything, you just find somebody and they'll get it for you. Cool. Um, and we, I just love that atmosphere, especially when it was at Trace Rios there in Glen Rose, man, because it was all – it was basically a, uh, a trailer park for a, an RV park, and everything was right there, you know, and – then they moved it out to Joe Pool Lake, and that was really, really a lot of fun out at Joe Pool Lake. But uh, that was – and I always just wish they did it still, you know. But they started doing um, – last year they started doing the Texas Music Reunion, which is basically – it's the same lineup that Tommy Iverson's family gathering always had, just a different name on it. Uh, Tommy okay. just didn't want to do the gathering no more, so he's like, well, we'll just change the name and we'll move along. <laughs> <laughs> so right now you're in West Texas and you're doing radio out there. What are you doing right now? I'm doing uh, I'm doing the Real Texas Morning Show with Crowman and Nash on um, 92.9 Shooter FM. First off, that, that name is there. really da, da, da. there. It is that name is killer. Crowman and Nash. Yeah. See again, it's cool because um, Mike Crow and I have worked together. Like this is our third time, fourth time we worked together. Um, oh wow! He actually was uh, he worked at the station in Cleburne at KTFW that hired me from Wichita Falls. And so I worked with him for a little while, and then uh, um, LKCM bought that station. So then they transferred me. They they cornered me up one night. They were like, hey, man, we want you to go to Corsicana, Texas, and do what you did in Wichita Falls. I'm like, Corsicana in my mind, and I'm thinking, oh, that sounds like a beach town, you know? Corsicana, like, Tropicana, yeah, I got it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I'm thinking, oh, coconut okay. drinks, baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking that same thing. Oh, I, go, I go, well, I don't know if I could do that or not. And they were like, well, um, would you at least go look at the station? I go, how far is it away from here? Is it a long ways away? And they were like, oh, no, it's only about 40 minutes south of Dallas. And I go, ah, oh, crap, that ain't a beach. <laughs> <laughs> and no so, beaches around Dallas, man. Yeah, it was funny because I went to Corsicana and I was there for a little while. And then, then Mike Crow came down there, was our station manager. And then yeah. he left again. And then uh, once he finally, he went back up to Fort Worth later on. And then once he moved down here to West, he's been after me for months to come down here and work. And I was just like, ah, oh, you know, I'm kind of doing my promotion thing. I'm good to go. And then finally, he and I started having some serious talks. And he was like, look, come to the morning show down here. And I'm like, by myself? And he goes, yeah, by yourself. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to do that. Morning radio by yourself is just not fun for me, man. I'm like, yeah. boring. You got to chat. So you got to talk back and forth, man. You got to have that back and forth banner. Yeah, exactly. So he called me back a couple of days later and he goes, all right, me and you going to do the morning show. And I was like, I'm in, man. I'm in. Give me, awesome. give me two weeks and I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. It's so now you're doing it out in, in – uh, is it in Waco? You live in, Yeah, it's in Waco and yeah. we live in West, which is uh, – it's about a 20 minute drive from my house to the station. Oh. So it's not bad. Yeah. Um, the, the way you sit down and talk to musicians has never been a, uh, you know, an interrogation. It's always been a right. conversation. <laughs> and I think that's the difference between you and a lot of uh, and interviews that I do. And I love your style. Um, I love that you have managed to, you give chances to people. You're so supportive. I remember going to a show with Luke Robinson and seeing you there and you were being very supportive. And I've seen you at a few other shows. Um, you make your way to the scene and it's, it's just a part of your life. And uh, I had to sit down and, and chat with you about your life, man, because you are a big, big, um, 
you were there. You were there in the beginnings of what we now call the outlaw. Because if it wasn't for Honky Tonk Friday nights, there would have been no interest in continuing with that sound in Wichita Falls. There's hardly an interest with, with the dudes up top now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you something, man. Yeah. To get that Texas Red Dirt music out, I cannot tell you how many times I bang my head on the wall just to get those guys to – let me try Honky Tonk Friday Night. Let me try to introduce this. You know what they do? They go, okay, you can have, you can have three hours. You can do uh, 7 to 11. I'm like, or no, 7 to 10. I go, okay, I'll take it. And they, the, they said, okay, your first time on, on doing that show is going to be on this Friday night. You know what it was? It was the start of high school football in Wichita Falls. Oh, yeah. That's uh, insane. Every radio station in town, except for KLUR, played high school football. So you had a you were the only station playing music. Yes, and oh. it scared it scared me to death because you know what? How football is king in Wichita Falls, man. You yeah. can't find many people that aren't in the high school football. So it scared me, and I'm like, all right, I'm up for the challenge. We'll do this. First book right out of the shoot, man. During Friday Night Football, I had a 25 share. Nice. On that three-hour swap, and I'm like, dude, this is awesome. So they saw, <laughs> so they saw that. Yeah, I got it, man. So that's, they saw that, and they were like, you know what? Why don't you go ahead and take uh, just 7 to midnight on Friday nights now? I go, all right, I'll do that. So that's, that's awesome. how we started getting the artists to stop by on Friday nights, you know, with there were the Coup de Gras. That was, that's another band that just highly impressed me, man. Yeah. They played. I love those guys. But all those bands that were coming down from Oklahoma and from Amarillo and stuff, we'd always get them to stop on Friday nights and hang out with us. And, dude, Honky Tonk Friday night got so big that people would start showing up in the back parking lot with their cookers and their coolers. And, dude, they're literally smoking meat and stuff in the back parking lot just to listen to the show on their radio. In that's, the back parking lot there at the radio station. I was just like, dude, this is getting insane, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I love the stories that we shared. We actually did this before. Yeah, was, yeah. It, you like came into town to promote was, a show and they were like, hey, you want Jim to be on the radio? I was like, yes, let's yeah, get him on the radio well, and chat. We, we, did it, we did it a couple of times because we did uh, my uh, the Honky Tonk Friday Night reunion show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when we had Casey Pilgrim and all those guys come in the studio with us, and then uh, a couple of artists that I was working with, we, I brought them through town, too, you know. But, yeah, uh, dude, some of the stories from Honky Talk Friday Night are legendary, man. I got to tell you this one, though. This is great. Talk to me. Over the, over the years, um, Woody Hayes, he was a guy that worked at KLUR. He's, he, he passed away a couple of years ago now. God rest his soul. I love that guy to death, man. Um, at, there, when he did – midnight to six i was doing seven to midnight you know so he was relieving me well by the time i got off man i was ready to drink a few cold beers you know so i'd go get some cold beers and he and i'd sit out behind the station there while he's doing his show and he'd run back and forth we'd drink cold beers well the first night we were doing it we had bottles and woody just kind of threw the bottle up on top of the building and i was like dude we're gonna get in trouble doing that he goes ah hell there's a bunch of them up there i go really he said, yeah, so over the years, man, we were tossing bottles and cans up on top of the roof. Oh, well, dude. <laughs> Jim Marks, one time, he was up there working on the air conditioner or something. And it was right <laughs> before I left Wichita Falls. He was up there on the roof, and he was like, uh, he started throwing beer bottles and beer cans off the top of the building onto the grass down there. And he goes, hey, Jim. I was standing down there smoking. And he, I looked up, and he goes, you know anything about these? I go, not a thing, sir. I said, Woody Hayes did all that. <laughs> <laughs> but Jim would look at me. Uh, he always he always wore he always wears glasses, and he he'd have those glasses up, and then he but he'd always put them right down at the tip of his nose, and he'd look over his eyes and he'd go, "Jim, really?" <laughs> Jim Marks. Yes. I know that look, man. I know that look. You've got in trouble too. <laughs> I've, gotten, I've gotten in trouble. As a matter of fact, when you came back for the Honky Tonk reunion, yeah. I, I want to say this is right, but I believe there was a picture taken of the back of the station and it had just beer cans back there the night you showed Oh, yeah. Up. It said, <laughs> there was, I think it was Keith Vaughn who saw it. And he, he said, Honky Tonk Friday nights? <laughs> 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 Oh, Keith, come up and drink beer with us a few times, too, man. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 
It was such a good vibe. People, whenever people bring it up, it's always a big smile on people's faces. When I started with the station, they yeah. would let me know about this roots, and they just what they wanted me to know was how it was rooted and what the origins of that what that station meant to them. And it right. was a great lesson. It was a great lesson to learn constantly from people that would talk about it, and then yeah. to sit down and talk to you about it made it even better because it let me know uh, what what the scene had been through, or at least as good as I could possibly you know find out about it right and let me know and you know the thing is it's like through. it's 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 good to that people know a uh, most and 99 percent of people when you talk to them they're interested in where that song came from where it come from you know and that's why we would you know during that show and stuff we'd have those artists in they would talk to us about the songs about their music and introduce us uh to them and a lot of the fans around that area they all became friends brandon jenkins i mean his wife to be lived in Iowa Park, Park you know? yeah. and, and Kim was just an awesome person. And, um, you know, that's kind of how they met by Brandon Jenkins being in town and hanging out with us, you know? And, um, so there's a lot of really, really cool heartwarming stories that came out of that. And a lot of the people are still, still fans today. And I still get people from Wichita Falls message me or something every now and then they're like, Hey man, remember this one time? I'm like, yeah, I remember that. You know, <laughs> some of them are like, no, you have to ring my bell. I don't remember that. Well, that's the worst. Uh, sounds yeah. like me, but I can't remember that at all. I've, I've, I've yeah, said that a couple times. Yeah. I'm sounds sure it happened, but I just don't remember the details. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you know it's good times. That's how you know it's yeah, good times. Yeah, absolutely. Well, man, thank you for uh, sitting down and, and chatting with me about uh, your career, your efforts in Wichita Falls, everything that you're up to now, everything that you've been up to, man. I, I know you're, uh, you're one of the greats that I look up to. It, it's been a, an honor sitting down talking with you, and uh, thank you so much for joining us, man. I appreciate well, absolutely, it. Absolutely, man. I look forward to seeing you uh, play some more tunes here pretty soon. Yeah, let's get back to rocking and rolling. I'm ready for that. No doubt, man. <laughs> <laughs> you take care, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it.